I'm Cheryl Bruno, editor of Secret Covenants, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. The best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Cheryl Bruno is the editor and author of Secret Covenants, New Insights on Early Mormon Polygamy. We're going to dive into the episode, you know, right before uh, Emma Smith died, she told her son that Joseph never participated in polygamy. A lot of people think she was lying about that. Cheryl Bruno has an interesting take on this that says that uh, Emma may not have been lying. So we're going to dive deep into Emma's denials, why she would have made such a statement, and was she present for the Partridge sisters' wedding? We'll find out more with Cheryl Bruno. You won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have a very busy author back on the show. For those of you who didn't see the previous segment, could you reintroduce yourself? I'm Cheryl Bruno, and I'm editor of this new book, Secret Covenants. She's been a very busy author, as you know. If you you watched the last segment, we just watched uh, her co-author with uh, John Dinger, and uh, Cheryl's written, well, edited. Can you talk a little bit about the editing process? What what is involved when you bring together all these different authors? Because there's like 12 or so. We talked about that before, but... Tell us about that. Okay. So as I've said before, Gary Bergera over at Signature Books, when he was still there, before he retired, asked me to put together a book out of made of essays about polygamy. And I think the original conception was that I would bring together essays that had already been written and then just put them into a book. But I thought that I would like to have new insights on early Mormon polygamy because it's been so long since we um, had Brian Hale's book come out or Todd Compton's In Sacred Loneliness has been many years since that came out. And so I thought we could come up with some new insights. And I asked a group of authors to get together and write me a chapter for this book. And um, I I chose many authors that were well-known for writing about polygamy And then I have a few new ones that um, this is their first publication. And it makes for a very great book. It Um, does. It's a great book, too. (laughs) The editing process is very intense. Um, So when when I first was asking these authors to write for me, first I had to have a conception of what the book would be so that they just didn't go off in all directions because I wanted it to be a cohesive book. So I had to be able to pitch... um, what it was going to look like to these authors so that they could fit their ideas into this cohesive whole. And then um, they sent me their first drafts. And in many cases, because I gave them a um, idea of how long I wanted it to be, and um, I had 10 authors and I didn't want to go over like 200 pages, but it actually did go quite over 200 pages, <laughs> 400 pages, twice as long. But some of the authors were very enthusiastic and gave me 80 pages. <laughs> and so I had to cut quite a bit. And, you know, you know how sad it is for an author, for their editor to just cut their baby in half, you know. <laughs> so, so you um, make them do it, though, don't you? Yes. But I would, you know, give them give them information on what, you know, I felt wasn't needed. And in in many cases, I did just line through, you know. Oh, really? Um, yes, because it's hard sometimes for an author to see when they've spent so much time on their book what, you know, they think everything is important. So sometimes you have to give them a little bit of help on that. And so okay. we went back and forth cutting a lot of them. And then um, when we thought we had it cut, they wanted to add more. <laughs> so they found something else. And um, so that was really interesting process that we went through. And I um, I had to wrestle some with some of the artic- or chapters had a tone that I didn't want to have in the book um, because I wanted to strike a very scholarly tone. Um, I did not want to be like anti-Mormon in any way, and yet or apologetic is, either. Or right? apologetic, that's right. So, so there's a certain tone I wanted to strike, and so I had to like argue a little bit with some of the some of the authors about um, you know fixing their tone, and so it was quite a long process. Um, I found that there weren't a lot of women that I could ask to give me a chapter on polygamy. Polygamy needs women's voices um, to discuss it in a balanced way. 
And we have many, many women who do activism around po polygamy. Yeah. But we don't have that many women who at the time, this was a couple of years ago when I was first putting this together, were doing scholarly work on polygamy. So that was um, disappointing to me to try to find women's voices. And I don't, I feel like I still have sort of a dearth of women's voices in this book. Although in the past two years now, there have been women that have stepped forth in writing scholarly um, treatments of polygamy. So I think that that's becoming better. Cool. So, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a difficult process. Oh, and then once um, we have done, Bradley and Chris Smith both wrote articles um, for Really me. good ones. Right. They're great articles. But then as they were doing these articles, they came up with a completely different insight that warranted another chapter. And so they both got together um, and came together to put another chapter in. Which is so, really good. Yeah, it's a great chapter. So um, it did end up a lot longer than I thought it would be. And it's very dense, um, but I think it's a great book. Very readable, I would say. Okay. So I... One of the nice things about it, this is more of an anthology, so you don't need to read it cover to cover. Right. You can just pick a chapter and read it. And so that's what I've done. I've been all over the place. Of course, I read your chapter. Um, I didn't read John's because I didn't get enough notice that he was coming. <laughs> but uh, Mark Tensmeyer, Claire mm -hmm. Barris, Marianne Clements, um, Don Bradley's chapter on Fanny Al Alger. Do you say Alger or Alger? Well, you know, now the thing is to say Alger, um, because the family now says Alger, or the family that is descended from Fanny, um, that um, group in Utah, um, calls it Alger. But now there's um, David Golding has done some research, and he says that Alger was the way that they pronounced it back then. So oh. really, you can say either one and okay. be pretty correct. Okay, well, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I like Alger better. So. Okay, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so it's, it's great. You, you don't have to read it cover to cover. You can pick and choose, and, and it's really fun. Um, I've, I've been reading Chris Smith and Don Bradley's chapter. I'm about halfway through, and it's just kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> it is mind-blowing, and that's why this, uh, this word, new insights, is really important because some of these, and especially the Bradley and Smith article, is very new insights that have never been brought forth before. And you yeah. think that um, everything that has to be said and polygamy has already been said but this is very new and i guarantee you have never heard it before yeah for sure for sure it's great well let's dive into your chapter uh you talk about emma smith's denials and uh you know we we there's also the partridge sisters which supposedly emma participated in that ceiling um and it's funny because I read your fat chapter first, but then I read Don and Chris's chapter, and I was like, oh, that has huge implications for your right. story You know, as well. another thing, let me go back for just a minute. Another thing I had to do in order to make the book cohesive is people had different ideas on how certain things happened historically, and I wanted to get them all together and try to figure out a way we were going to say it where we weren't all contradicting each other. And that was another um, uh, we did quite a bit of work on that so that, and we still have differences, but um, we wanted to make it so it wasn't like you read the book and you were just very confused about well, what happened. And I, I think that's great. But from my point of view, I love it when people disagree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get all the different perspectives. Okay. So, yeah. so disagreement is fine with me. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there will be different perspectives, but um you know, I I just don't want total disagreement on, especially on things that we can that maybe are facts that we can look at and come well, to a consensus on. And in reading Chris and Don's chapter, it gave me some other questions that I want to ask you. Okay. So, um, okay. especially since I read it after I read your chapter, I was like, oh, well, that's an interesting insight. I think one of the big uh, insights into the into your chapter specifically was, you know, there's a story about uh, Emma agreeing to allow Joseph Smith to be married to 
the Partridge sisters. Is it Elizabeth and Eliza or something like that? Emily and Eliza Partridge. Okay. So the traditional story of Emily and Eliza Partridge is that Emma agreed that Joseph could be sealed to the sisters and that she participated in the sealing. And then when she saw Joseph in, intimate with one of the sisters, I don't remember which one, she got, became upset and threw a fit, threw him out of the house and uh, renounced all polygamy or what uh, anything that she had agreed to. So where is that story wrong? <laughs> okay, so the first thing is that um, the story is, and it comes from Emily Partridge, her her um, later reminiscences, um, that they married Joseph Smith. They were brought into polygamy first, and that both of the girls married Joseph Smith. And then um, after that, Joseph was able to convince Emma for a short period of time to agree to marry some wives. And the wives that she chose were Emily and Eliza, but they did not want to tell her that they were already married to Joseph Smith, and so they had a repeat ceremony where where um, apparently Emma gave them kind of gave them to Joseph and put their her hand on there yeah. or something. Well, one of the counts says she put her hand in his, and um, so gave her, her away. Um, so. What in doing a little bit of further research, um, we have affidavits, later affidavits in Utah from both Emily and Eliza, and they give dates of the marriage, and they give um, the officiator of the marriage, who was James Adams, was participating in these in the marriage that Emma participated in, and when we look at, and this is the work that Johnny did. Um, he looked at the dates that James Adams was in town because he was from out of town, Springfield, I believe, and then he came into Nauvoo. And we have the dates that he was in Nauvoo. We have the dates that Emma was in and out of Nauvoo, that Joseph was in and out of Nauvoo. And we have, you know, a certain time period when the, this could have happened that all three were together. And uh, it doesn't quite work with the affidavits. And so Johnny was saying, well, did this even happen? Did a marriage even happen? Uh, where uh, where um, Emma agreed to was part of the right, ceremony, right? So that's what I kind of investigated in this chapter. And so was Emma part of the ceremony? <laughs> I believe there is good reason to to think that she was not a part of the. Ceremony. Oh wow, that's quite a wrinkle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you believe that? So um, let's go back to, um, in our previous conversation, we talked a little bit about Andy E. Hatt's thesis. Okay. And he says in his thesis that he believed, well, he obviously believed that Emma was part of the second ceremony, or I don't know, second and third, <laughs> where Emily and Eliza, it's very confusing. But um, but um, Andy E. Hatt says that um, Emma had to, in order to receive her higher ordinances as part of the Quorum of the Anointed, she had to accept polygamy. And so this was the time when she accepted polygamy. She let Joseph marry Emily and Eliza. And then a short time after, she reneged on her promise and kicked them out of the house. And after that was kind of um, a polygamy advocate or foe, I guess. Yeah. So one question I had was these marriages to the Partridge sisters, did that occur before or after uh, DNC 132 that was in July of 1843, I believe? Right. So um, Emily and Eliza were married to Joseph Smith the first time before that revelation. And then after Emma became aware of polygamy and after the 132, was when she agreed to the marriage um, and participated so, in it. it was both, <laughs> before both. and after. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's interesting. <laughs> All right. but So you don't think she participated in the second ceremony? So there were two ceremonies? So um, I don't, the evidence is very... Um, is late and a little bit um, convoluted, and so... I'm not even sure that there were, you know, there were any ceremonies at all. Oh, um, that's why I feel like some of the um, polygamy skeptics have 
um, a leg to stand on on some of these marriages of Joseph Smith's um, because we're not really sure about ceremonies and what the dates were. And since it's so late, I mean, Emily and Eliza were very firm in remembering that they had married Joseph Smith. Okay. And so there had um, to be at least one ceremony then, right? Well, I believe there was at least one ceremony. Okay. And I believe there was something that, I mean, their story seems very, um, they're very sure that, that Emma participated in some kind of something, you know, acquiescing to their union with Joseph Smith. Now, whether it was a knowledge Emma, Emma had that they were actually going to be wives in very deed, you know, or whether it was going to be some kind of dynastic ceiling. We're not really sure what Emma's understanding was. So perhaps Emma could have had an understanding that these were just ceilings and wouldn't necessarily be a marriage with a consummated marriage. And so when then she, when she saw then Joseph Smith in bed with somebody, she just, that's when she lost it and threw everybody out. Well, it, so. it brings up a question, and I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Don and Chris yet, uh, but they brought up such a, what's the word, just an interesting perspective on the whole Fanny Alger mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. And so I want to bring this up because I think it's related here. Okay. So, for those of you who haven't read the chapter, it's amazing. And I've only read half of it. <laughs> um, the, the thesis of their chapter is that it seems that both Joseph and Oliver uh, were sealed to, uh, in, in, a, in a form of a adoptive sealing, Oliver adopted a girl that was, I think, just 10. I believe mm -hmm. her name was Fuller, if I Adeline remember Adeline right. Fuller. Okay. And then Joseph may have been sealed to Fanny Alger as, at least in Oliver's understanding, an adoptive type sealing. Because mm -hmm. Oliver apparently treated this sealing with Catherine Fuller as a, as a child. She was just 10, I believe. Adeline, yeah. And so, uh, whereas Joseph, it became a little bit more romantic, it right. appears. And so then that's why Oliver accused Joseph of the dirty, nasty, filthy scrape exactly. or affair. And so I wonder, and I really want to talk to Don and Chris about this because it's an amazing chapter. But I do wonder, it seems like it would have been easier, at least with Oliver, and I, and I would assume with Emma and other people, to say, hey, I want to be sealed to the, because they were still pretty young, the Partridge sisters. I don't know if you remember how yeah, old they were. Yeah, like 1920. Okay, so older, yeah, I mean, marriageable age, I guess. But it would have been easier to say, Emma, I'm just being sealed adoptively. It's not a marriage thing. It would have been easier to get Emma to consent to something like that. Yes, but I mean, we just don't have any evidence that she agreed to an adoptive sealing. Or we, at all. But we do have, I mean, we have more evidence in the Fanny Alger um, case, and they oh. will they will talk about that. But with um, the Partridge sisters, um, it may have been that it was presented as a marriage, but maybe for eternity, as Brian would call it, something that wasn't going to be consummated on the earth but still kind of a marriage alliance. Okay, so if it's a marriage that's not consummated, I can see Emma reluctantly agreeing to something like that. And then when, I mean, who knows what happened <laughs> between Joseph and one of the sisters, but um, if it was affectionate at all, I can, I can easily see Emma mm -hmm. becoming very upset about mm -hmm. that. Right. So, but it might have been an easier sell, if I can mm -hmm. use that right. term, uh, to sell Emma on this kind of adoptive ceiling idea than, than a sexual ceiling, for sure. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, so you think there was probably only one ceremony? And so how do we get this to ceremony Yeah, I'm not sure it's on the ceremonies. That's the thing, is that... Um, there was actually later in Utah, that was a big thing is they wanted to show that ceremonies happened around these things. And so they wanted to distinguish it from John C. Bennett's spiritual whiffery, where he just would have, 
you know, liaisons with these women. Um, and so now they're going to, um, in Brighamite um, polygamy, it was it definitely had to be along with a marriage ceiling. And so I'm not quite sure um, that all of the women who married Joseph in Nauvoo had a, a ceiling ceremony as we picture it now in our church. Okay. Because I think, if I remember right, you probably know this better than me, it seems like both Todd Compton and Brian Hales were trying to find evidence that a ceremony occurred. But you're saying some of these, especially early seeing, may not have had a ceremony? Yeah, I mean, I, I really, I haven't done a lot of research on that particular thing with all, you know, I'm I'm just starting with Emily and okay. Eliza, and it seems that there are very uh, many problems around how these ceilings took place, whether there were two, what exactly the story was, because I, th I feel that um, Emily and Eliza were telling the truth as what they recalled, um, you know, Joseph Smith somehow bringing them into you know, a marriage and maybe, you know, Emma not being aware and then later being aware. And so it's the, the documentation is very sparse. And so it's difficult to know exactly what was going on. But what I'm trying to do here is just call into, um, attend, call the attention of people to the fact that, you know, we do have a discrepancy. We have a date given where it couldn't have happened because James Adams wasn't in town. So um, Todd Compton has tried to propose other dates. I think Don Bradley also has tried to pr propose other dates for this when it could have happened. And Johnny Stevenson was pushing back against this, saying, no, this date couldn't have happened. No, this date couldn't have happened. And so when did the ceiling happen if there was such a ceiling? And there was only a short window of time when it could have happened because then James Adams dies. Okay. So, whatever happened, that had to be happened before he died. Right, right. <laughs> so, what's your best reconstruction of the events that happened then? <laughs> um, I, I actually don't do a reconstruction. I just, you know, I'm saying this is, you know, this is fishy, this is fishy, this is fishy. So, um, but what I'm trying to reconstruct is possibilities for why Emma then continued to deny polygamy all the rest of her life. That's really what my chapter is about because um, we've we've wondered what if we believe that em Emma was aware of Joseph Smith's polygamy, which I think she was aware of Joseph Smith's polygamy, um, then why did she, after he died, continue to deny, continue to deny? And I use Emily and Eliza's cases as um, just kind of a, a glimpse into perhaps some reasons why she would have denied um, that Joseph practiced polygamy. Okay. So one reason could have been that um, people, uh, the sealing ceremony was supposed to be secret, very secret. And so everyone in Nauvoo kept that secret until they went out to Utah and then there was a difference. They were now going to be public with it. And so they were able to talk about it. But Emma wasn't part of the saints that went out to Utah. So maybe she was still keeping the secret as she has had covenanted to do. Okay. So, right? She promised that she would never tell, and then she never did. Okay. okay? So that could be a reason. Um, a second reason could be later in Utah, some of the people who were um, explaining what they were doing in Nauvoo said, well, we were giving like carefully worded denials. You know, we denied that it was happening, but the wording was such that we could say, oh, we never practiced spiritual whiffery, but we did practice celestial plural marriage, right. you know? So they just carefully, or polygamy. they were yeah. careful with their wording so that, you know, they could deny it, but still maintain plausible deniability. <laughs> so perhaps this is what Emma's doing. When you look at her, um, her testimonies, and we don't really have them in her own words per se. We just have what other people are reporting she said to them. So we can't really see. Including Joseph Smith the third, the her third, son. Right. right. So, I mean, I think we can pretty much see what she was saying, but maybe he didn't preserve the wording exactly right. It seems pretty much like she was denying it. Okay. You know, she's not trying. It doesn't seem like she's trying to slip out of it. Well, and we talked to John Dinger about... 
in the case of Joseph Smith's denials, that these were legal denials, mm-hmm. not necessarily religious denials. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, right. Could Emma, Emma be doing the same thing? Yes, she could be doing the same thing. Okay. So, um, But it's hard to tell because, like I said, we don't have her own wording, you know, her own handwriting, her own... Yeah, so it's it's hard to really tell, but um, I don't think that's one of the um, the scenarios that I don't really believe has much um, plausibility. So you you so don't, I don't think like she was doing legal denials? I like um, the I think that perhaps she was keeping a secret, and then the third reason is that she may have um, well, there's several, but um, she may have like just kind of erased it from her memory. Because she just didn't want to think about it. It was very traumatic for her. You know, this was a trauma response to a very horrible thing that happened to her. And perhaps she put it out of her mind. And then later when people asked her, she was just like, oh, no, that never happened. Hmm. You know, that can happen. Well, especially um, with uh, Louis Biedemann, her second husband, who then cheated on her. Right, right. So. That must have been horribly traumatic. So we know this happens. We've seen this in modern days where people have traumatic things happen to them, and then they need, like, hypnosis to call it back to them, you know. So, I mean, there are many cases where it's the hypnosis has been called into question, but we do know that there are cases when you just blank something out. And I, in fact, have one of these cases in my own life oh. where um, I was a teenager when an occurrence happened that the rest of my family remembers very clearly, and I was present, and it happened over and over, but I have erased it from my memory, and I s- completely do not remember it ever happening, hmm. right? And it's very strange that I can't call that up out of my memory. Um, so I know it happens. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. So that could be a possibility. And then the last possibility is that um, she said at one time that um, she, uh, uh, referring to some documents, she was saying that if I never saw it, I don't have anything to say about it. So a possibility, if indeed she was not a part of Eliza and Emily's marriages, and she never saw with her own eyes Joseph Smith marrying these other women, she may have felt like she could deny it um, and say, well, I never personally saw it, so it just didn't happen. So that would refer to the first secret ceremony? Is that that what you're referring to? No, the second one, if there was not a second ceremony where she actually participated, um, then she might never have seen, she might have heard rumors, but she never saw Joseph actually with these other women. So you're saying that she could have agreed to the ceiling and but but not participated. No, she never agreed to anything and she never saw anything, which is a possibility that I that oh, I okay. mentioned in here in my chapter. If she never agreed to anything, she never saw anything, then she could say, well, I don't think he did it. Okay. But I think she knew he did it, but that she could say I didn't I wasn't part of it. Would some people call that lying where she had yeah. good evidence that he was participating, but she just refused to acknowledge it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good. But really, we don't know. And so we, we have to look at these possibilities. We have to look at the evidence that we have and kind of um, make um, suppositions. And so I think that that is why the polygamy skeptics are important to listen to because they can take some of these um, marriage, Joseph Smith had many marriages, and they can take some of them and show that they perhaps were not, we don't have as much evidence as we think we do, right? Okay. So, for example, the Lawrence sisters, who were also in the Joseph Smith home at the same time as um, as uh, Partridge. the Partridge sisters, we don't have good evidence for them either. You know, one of them actually denied that she ever um, at, was had a relationship with Joseph Smith. So, um, so let's balance the evidence. Let's see what we have, and let's look at it again. If we want to maintain our our narrative that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, we have to actually engage with this evidence again with our new insights that we have. And try to figure out, is it as strong as we thought it was? Okay. If it's not, then we got to look at it again. Okay. So, um, 
Let's see. I'm trying to decide. Do we want to go with the Lawrence sisters? Is that the next kind of denial, or are there other denials that we'd like to talk about? That Emma. Um, I mean, Emma never directly um, talked about the Lawrence sisters. Okay. But um, let's let's talk about some of her denials. Um, so, I think some of her denials had to do with her sons because she always told her sons that she never practiced polygamy. And so then they went out to Utah after they had associated with the reorganized church. They went out to Utah to kind of be missionaries for the reorganized church. And they preached that Joseph Smith did not practice polygamy. So in the 1860s, Joseph F. Smith and Joseph Smith III, who were cousins, had this series of letters that went back and forth where they kind of Joseph Smith III defending his mother, saying she wasn't a liar, and Joseph F. Smith saying, oh, everybody knows that, yeah, so. Um, and Joseph F. was Hiram's son. Mm-hmm, right, right. So um, then in Utah Territory in 1866, um, they went to a— California, um, Joseph Smith III and his brother Alexander went to a mission in California, and on their way over there, they stopped in Utah, and they kind of um, did the same thing where they tried to preach to these people, and and um, Joseph F. Smith was trying to introduce them to or gather together some of the women that he knew were plural wives of Joseph Smith and get affidavits from them to testify that they had practiced polygamy because they didn't want Joseph Smith III to think that. And there wasn't a lot of evidence at that point. So a lot of the evidence that we have comes after Joseph F. Smith wanted to gather together these affidavits and testimonies from the women who had participated in it. Okay, so that was the reason. Okay, that's interesting. So then in the 1870s, David Smith went over to, he was a very fragile, one of the sons of Joseph Smith, who was pretty fragile. And he, she, Emma was pregnant with David when Joseph died. Right, right? That's, who, that's who that was. And um, he went out to Utah, and they say there are um, some, re, there's some reason to think that he was very disturbed by evidence that he encountered when he went out to Utah that his father had participated in polygamy. And this caused him to, um, and it was one of many reasons why he later entered an, an institution. Um, he was institutionalized for um, mental issues. But I want to read this too, because this is, um, this is kind of where we get that idea from. A note in David's file at the Northern Illinois Hospital and Asylum for the Insane recorded, he, David, with his brother, had been joined together in preaching and teaching against the plurality of wives and had argued against same in 1873. It was proved to him that his father did believe in the doctrine and met several of his wives, also saw many men who used to be with his father who told him the same. This was a disappointment to him, and he disliked to take sides against his brother, who was Joseph Smith III, or going with him. David regarded that his mother deceived him in relation to the matter. Hmm. The conclusion was that, quote, the result was the impairment of his mind. So the people at the asylum felt that his um, brain issues um, had to do with him finding out that his father was a polygamist. Hmm. That, I mean, that would be hard to accept, especially when you told your whole life it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So... Okay, that was in the 1870s, you right, said? Right, right. And then I'm trying to remember when Emma died. That's, 1879, that's she gives her last testimony. Okay, and, Joseph and this is the most well-known denial. Mm -hmm. Joseph Smith III was, because, I mean, missionaries from Utah would come to Nauvoo and talk with Emma, and so several of them wrote down, you know, they had they're always their question was, did Joseph Smith practice polygamy? And it seemed that every time someone asked her that, she denied it. But then, and right before she died, um, her son Joseph Smith III came to her, and he has notes of an interview that he had with her. And this is when he kind of grilled her on the subject, and she very clearly said that um, Joseph never practiced it. Okay. So he published it then after her death because she died very soon after this interview, and then it was published. In the Saints Herald, I believe. Mm -hmm. 
And that was in 1879. So he asked, one of the questions he asked was, what about the revelation on polygamy? Did Joseph Smith have anything like it? What of spiritual wifery? So he's trying to drill down there, right? And say, I usually say spiritual wifery. Is there a reason why you say wifery? Um, that's just how I've always said it. Oh, okay. (laughs) So. Because I noticed John Dinger said that too, and I was like, oh, I always thought it was spiritual wifery. (laughs) Okay. Well, I guess you could pronounce it either way. Yeah. Um, so she replied in his notes, he says she replied, there was no revelation on either polygamy or spiritual wives. So see, that's kind of like, there's not a lot of wiggle room right there. Right. Is there? Um, there were some rumors of something of the sort, which of which I asked my husband. He assured me that all there was of it was that in a chat about plural wives, he had said, well, such a system might possibly be if everybody was agreed to it and would behave as they should, but they would not. And besides, it was contrary to the will of heaven. Huh. So isn't that interesting? It seems to me like Joseph is a bit more evasive than Emma was. Emma's saying no. But then she, when she quotes what, what her husband said to her, that seems like a little bit of an evasive answer. Well, to and I wonder, could she be referring to celestial plural marriage instead of those other terms like polygamy and spiritual wifery? Um, yeah, I mean. I mean, that would be a carefully that would worded be a, denial. There would, that would be a carefully worded denial, yes. Okay. Because they didn't ask about celestial, celestial plural, plural marriage. marriage so. True. True. So. so, hmm. Do you, because you gave, was it four possibilities that Emma might have, mm-hmm. or reasons yeah. why she might have been denying right. this? Do you have a sense that one case is stronger than the other? Um, I feel that the one, I, I don't like the carefully worded denials one as much as the others. Um, um, I mean, I don't have really any evidence that would point to one over the other, so that's why I, I mean, some people can look at this chapter and say, you're really being wishy-washy. But um, I feel like as historians, sometimes we have to do that. We have to say when we have evidence of something and when we really don't. And this is something that is a conundrum because I really do believe that she was aware. There are There is evidence that she was aware of it, right, of, yeah. of the rumors and of Joseph. But we just don't have evidence of why then she would deny it. Yeah, because she was the president, the first president of the Relief Society, mm-hmm. and so there, she turned that organization into an anti-polygamy. Yes, and group. it's it sort of seems like Joseph Smith was making it kind of um, a sort of a polygamy positive uh, place to be, and then because <laughs> her counselors were polygamous, not, yeah. She would not have it. <laughs> they were kind of working against each other, mm-hmm. which, you know, I can see why. <laughs> but uh, so I know, so it's interesting because we don't want to call Emma lying about these denials, um, but but there's not evidence that, for example, she participated in the partridge ceilings. So... Uh, where do we stand on this? It's just vague and we can't come up with any so, answers? I mean, I'm always uncomfortable when people are saying, oh, he lied about this or she lied about that, um, because I don't know that I've always in my life been truthful, but I've tried to be, um, you know, I don't. I wouldn't say that I'm a liar, but um, sometimes there are reasons that you might want to present something as a little bit different or... Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And then somebody could come back and say, you are a liar, and technically they'd be right. But, you know, there are reasons why, like John Dinger pointed out, that um, there are legal reasons why Joseph Smith might not have wanted to make it public that he was practicing. And so there may have been reasons why Emma ha- that Emma had um, that make perfect sense. Um, but And especially the one where if she blocked it out of her mind— I wouldn't necessarily then say that she was lying about it. Or if, you know, if you promise to keep something secret, you don't, you know. You're supposed to keep it secret. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so. And so, huh, that's very interesting. So I think there's ways that you can behave um, with integrity and still technically be lying about something. And people are going to blast me for that, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs> 
I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Cheryl Bruno. She's the editor and author of Secret Covenants, New Insights into Mormon Polygamy. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about why Cheryl thinks that Joseph did indeed practice polygamy. And I've talked to a lot of polygamy skeptics that say that William Marx's um, statements are one of the things that give them pause, that make them think, you know, maybe he had good um, reason to believe that Joseph practiced polygamy. The one I like the most is, um, and John Dinger has talked about it before too, that um, William Marx was um, the first counselor to Joseph Smith III, and he met with their Council of the Twelve Apostles in a meeting where the Council of the Twelve asked him, did Joseph practice polygamy? Point blank. And William Marx talked about the time when Hiram Smith was wondering about polygamy and said he was going to go to Joseph, and he came back with the revelation and presented it to the High Council. So that how that's hard to get around because at the time, William Marx actually had motivation to deny polygamy because here he was in the reorganized church and he was first counselor to Joseph Smith III who was denying polygamy. So he did not have motivation to say, you know, 132 was presented before the high council and yet he did. So that's hard to get around. Thanks for listening and I hope you to continue to enjoy Gospel Tangents. Consider becoming a Patreon or go to gospeltangents.com slash shop and you can get a cool tie a hat, or even a nice mug. You can also get a sweatshirt. So check it out at gospeltangents.com shop.